Amen, Greg. I appreciated that, brother. Let's pause for prayer once again. Oh, Father, just now, I want to thank you because you have already shown us that you're here in this place with us. And I want to ask for your continued abiding presence. I pray, Lord, that as we get into your word now, you will give us ears to hear and eyes to see. May our hearts be changed and our minds be renewed. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, our message is entitled, Be Intentional. Be Intentional. And I'm talking about living life deliberately. I, I want to start out just by sharing just a, a short story that is just very simple. I have a garden. I have a garden in my backyard. It's about four feet by eight feet. It's just a tiny little garden. But I decided that I wanted to have some cucumbers and some tomatoes this year. And I wanted them to be from my garden, not from the store. So, what do you suppose I did? You suppose I just hoped for it and they came? Or did I, do you think I just prayed, Lord, please let some tomatoes and cucumbers grow out there? No, what I did was I was very intentional. I got a shovel and a hoe and I cultivated that soil and I pulled all the weeds out of there and I got the soil all prepared and then I planted some little plants. I know some of you start with seeds. I started with little, little plants. And I planted the little plants in there and then I kept watering them. Every now and then I'd loosen the soil again, pull the weeds out, kept watering them. I was very intentional. Now I, I couldn't actually make the cucumbers or the tomatoes grow. That's whose part? That's God's part, right? He's the one that actually makes that fruit show up. But what I was doing is I was trying to be very intentional about receiving that fruit into my life. And by being intentional, I then had an expectation that God would show up and do what God does. And that's bring the miracle of life. Right? And you know, at first, only the cucumbers did good. I mean, the cucumbers pretty much took over the whole garden. They were growing prolifically, and I got a whole bunch of them. And it looked like those three tomato plants weren't going to do anything. They kept getting big and tall, but they wouldn't do anything. Pretty soon, my family ended up saying, why are you still messing with those things? Those things aren't going to give any fruit. What are, you, what are you doing out there? Leave them alone. Why are you watering those? It's past the fruit season, whatever. But I kept on. And do you know, in the last two to three weeks, I've had nearly four dozen tomatoes out of that plant, those three plants. Big time fruit. <clears throat> and I guess what I'm saying is this. I was intentional about preparing things for God to do a miracle. That was just in my garden. What I want to ask and challenge you about is are you being intentional about taking steps and preparing for God to bring fruit into your life personally? So that's kind of the theme today, being very intentional. And I want to talk to you a little bit here about what intentional living looks like. Now, some of you have heard me say this before. That's okay. You're going to hear it again. 
a wise leadership guru said that success is not gained in a day it is gained in the daily do you understand the difference you can't expect that you're going to just do something today that's gonna bring, bring, bring big success into your life but you can expect that by doing things with regularity and discipline that you can have an expected end because of what you're doing in other words you can expect that as you are faithful in sowing that God will crown your efforts with success there's a difference brothers and sisters between trying and training okay um, let's pretend that there is a marathon that is going to be ran on Monday if there was a marathon that was going to be ran on Monday and I decided that I was going to run in it and Gary your son Neil decided he was going to run in it I can guarantee you that my results would be much worse than Neil's results because I don't train for that I, I'm not preparing myself running Neil he runs he's a runner and I'm gonna tell you something there's a difference even if I showed up Gary and I tried way harder than Neil did if my effort was through the roof and Neil wasn't trying that hard Neil would still beat me because it'd be the difference big time between trying and training so do you see the difference and here's the thing we're talking about a, a race right now in fact let's let's take a look at what scripture has to say about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 we're gonna look at verses 24 through 27 and if you brought your Bible today could you say amen? amen very good would you turn there with me then 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and uh, we're gonna read verses 24 through 27 all right if you're there just say amen again very good beginning in verse 24 then it says do you not know that those who run in a race all run but one receives the prize run in such a way that you may obtain it and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain what kind of a crown a perishable crown but we for an imperishable crown therefore I run thus not with uncertainty and thus I fight not as one who beats the air but I what's that word I discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when I have preached to others I myself should become disqualified what he's talking about is being prepared having disciplined himself having trained himself having taken steps so that he's ready for the race and now he's, he's said that they do it for a perishable crown people train for marathons they train for triathlons they train for smaller events but are we training for the most important event are we training for this race of life toward heaven toward eternal life are we training or are we just trying do you just in the moment you know here the circumstance arrives and you try real hard or are you training so that when the circumstance arrives you are prepared and you are ready to deal with what's at hand there's a difference there amen hello amen. amen there's a difference now I want to talk to you about some steps there are at least five steps to intentional living and they are making a choice make a plan execute the plan evaluate and then make adjustments now here's what I'm talking about as you're trying to have a change come into your life let me, let me put it this way let's say that uh, you decided man I sure could use I, sh I could lose a few pounds you know Amen. around the midsection 
Well, I'll tell you something. That's not going to happen just because you wish it would happen. <laughs> you know, if you keep doing the same stuff, it's, it's, and eating the same stuff, and, and your activity level remains the same, so is your waistline if it's not going to get bigger, right? Okay, so anyhow, you've got to be intentional about things. And so I want to talk just a little bit about each one of these. As far as making a choice, everyone is going somewhere, and a few are going somewhere on purpose. And I want to be in that number who is going somewhere on purpose. In other words, I'm not just spinning my wheels. I'm not running in circles. I'm not chasing my tail. I'm not going backwards. But I have a destination in mind. And I am decidedly, deliberately taking steps to move in the direction that gets me to my destination. And I want to live that way. I believe our church should operate that way too. That's why it's important that we will be having some, some meetings at some point in the very near future to plan out some things that we're going to do as a church family. So that we're not, you know, I, I don't think that you can truly be blessed if you're just sitting around and then you react to what's happening around you. Something happens and then you react to it. That's, that's not the same as being deliberate and being intentional, doing things with purpose. So, after you make your choice, then you need to make a plan. Here it says, if you fail to plan, then you plan to what? To fail. I can remember <clears throat> being in a literature evangelist meeting, because I used to be a literature evangelist, and I remember the leader was dealing with all of us uh, area coordinators and as he was talking with us in this meeting he said now how many of you know where you're going what neighborhood you're going to be in next Tuesday and one guy raised his hand and the rest of us were all sitting there you know looking around we didn't know what neighborhood we were going to be in we were just expecting that we were going to be out there you know we'd figure that out but he rebuked us big time. And he said this word, this phrase right there. If you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. And I want you to know that in your Christian life, this couldn't be more true. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And here's the thing. What do you mean, Pastor? How, how could we plan our, our Christian life? Well, how about, do you have a plan to worship daily? Right? Do you have a plan to be involved in what God is doing? Do you have a plan to be a part of the church body and its activities? Do you, you see what I'm saying? We have to plan. And you have to execute that plan. Plan your work and then work your plan. Now, let's say that, and I know I kind of keep picking on health right now, but I'm, I'm just going to do it for sake of illustration. But let's say that I did decide that I wanted to lose a few pounds. Okay? So, I had made my plan. Well, my plan is that <clears throat> I'm going to get to the gym and exercise for an hour three nights a week and I'm going to eat a green salad every day as a part of my diet and I'm going to make sure that I drink at least eight cups of water every day so that I'll drink less soda okay so those are my three those are three measurable things that I'm gonna try to do to address my health problem which is my bulging waistline okay so now the thing is that's only going to work if I actually do it. Isn't that right? I mean, if I don't get out to the gym and I don't eat my salads and I'm not drinking water, how is that going to make any difference? You've got to work the plan after you make the plan. Amen? And then we have to evaluate. 
This quote here says, one of the great mistakes is to judge policies and programs by their intentions rather than their results. In other words, results speak. Now, I'm not saying that the end justifies the means. That's not what this means. But what it does mean is that sometimes there are policies and programs in place, whether it's in your life, in your family, in your church, that are just there. And when they were established, they were established with good intentions. But some of them are not working. And here's the thing. A wise leader says, once said, if the horse is dead, dismount. Right? <laughs> so, we want to do the same thing with... with policies and, and practices in our own lives, we want things in our lives that are making a difference. Doesn't that make sense? You want to do things that are, are bearing fruit and making a difference for your life, for your family, for your church, for the purpose of God. Then, as we evaluate, sometimes you see that you must make adjustments. One definition of insanity is to continue doing the same thing while expecting different results. <clears throat> now, Ed, you, you, you're a builder, right? I, can you imagine if, if I was trying to make some, some wooden objects that uh, I had to mass produce and every single time that I made one, when I put these two boards together, I always hammered and got my thumb every time. Every time. I did it today. I did it yesterday. I did it and I kept doing it day after day after day after day. I kept hammering my thumb. That would be crazy, wouldn't it? It would be just crazy. You've got to find something else that works. Right? Well, that's easy to see in that silly little illustration. But what about in our actual lives? What about how we're living? Do you find yourself falling and failing in the same areas over and over and over and over and over again? And then you go, man, this is crazy. <laughs> what am I doing? Here's the thing. We have to do something di different. We have to be intentional about changing the, our approach. Doesn't that make sense? If you keep doing the same thing, you're going to keep getting the same results. And it's crazy to think you won't. Isn't that right? All right. Now, having said all of that, I want to take a look back at our opening text with a couple more verses added. In Deuteronomy <clears throat> chapter 30, Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'm going to read verses 15 through 20. Okay? So just uh, follow along here. And picking up in verse 15, it says, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which, the Lord, which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose what? Choose life. That both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them. So here's the thing. In this, it is clear that a choice is laid out, isn't it? 
And you have to be intentional about the choice that you're going to make. Because I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. This is a warning. This is a flat-out warning. To be complacent and to not be deliberate and choose God is to choose death. Do you understand that? When you choose God and you say, I am yours and you are mine and we are in this covenant and I will follow you and I will trust you, you have chosen life. If you are not deliberate about making that choice, you are on the path to hell, my friend. By hell, I mean death. Right? All right, then. So you see in here, in verse 20, where it said, you, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him. To obey, to cling, these are things that you have to be intentional about. I'm moving forward. I want you to consider these passages. What I have listed here are just some little excerpts. You'll recognize the passages. Every one of these passages is, is a, a command, as it were. It's, it's a statement that is expecting that you will take action. And the, the only way they come to pass is if you take action. And it says, cast all your gear cares upon him, for he careth for you, right? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Right? Take up your cross and follow me. These are all action words. You have to be intentional. Seek first the kingdom of God. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Ask, seek, and knock. Meditate on these things. This comes from Philippians 4, 8, right? Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble. You know the script. Meditate on these things. Here's my point. Every one of those words that you see in italics, those are words that require you to be intentional. They're not just going to happen. You have to be intentional about it. So here's the thing. As I'm looking at God's word, and as I'm considering the journey that we are all on, because we are not home, amen? amen. We are pilgrims. We're looking forward to a better country, right? A heavenly country. And we need to be intentional about how we are living this life and how we are spending our time and how we are building our relationship with God. What we are doing each day. Consider God's word. I want you to consider these words that I'm going to put on the screen now. That are, all these words are directly tied to a Christian lifestyle. And I, this list is by no means exhaustive. But on this list, you will recognize that every one of these words are a pivotal part of a Christian lifestyle. And I want you to ask yourself, can these things be done if I'm not intentional? Okay, check it out. Believe. Obey, honor, repent, forgive, praise, worship, serve. Can any of those things be done without being intentional? No, they cannot. You must be intentional about them. And these things are hallmarks in the Christian lifestyle. Amen? Amen. If we are going to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we have to be decidedly, deliberately, intentionally disciples of Jesus Christ.
I want to share something with you. I want you to consider for a moment, and I don't want you to speak out about it. But I want you to consider for a moment, what is my personal devotional life like? What is a word that I could use to describe my personal devotional experience with God? Now, as you're thinking, I want you to keep in mind this kind of concept. When I used to tell Evan and his brother and Coral, I used to ask them every day, have you had your devotions? Sounded like sort of, have you had breakfast? You know, have you partook? And it started to sound like over time something that they would check off a list. Yep. Then I said, I, it's just really kind of a nuance. It's semantics. But I changed it to, have you done your devotions? I started asking them that. Because I wanted them to engage, to be active. And, it, and, and that started to feel like a chore, an obligation. That kind of thing. I'm praying about this and I'm thinking about it. And I finally started asking them, have you devoted your life to God today? And that made a big difference in the way they, the question that they perceived I was asking them and in the way that I was trying to hold them accountable. Have you devoted your life to God today? So, as you think about your own devotional time, your own devotional experience, mindful of what we've just talked about, I want you to think of a word, and I don't want you to call it out or anything, but how would you describe it? I mean, is it, is it fresh and special? Is it, is it powerful? Is, is it anemic? Is it inconsistent? Is it, is it steady? Is it encouraging it's what is it what I do know is whatever it is whatever it is it can be better not because I'm not trying to say nobody's good enough that's not what I'm trying to do today what I'm trying to say is we should never settle for less than what God really wants to give to us what does he want to perform in your life, sister? I know. I know exactly what he wants. He wants to perform a miracle in your life. Just like he does in your children's. Just like he does in your life, Laura. And yours and yours. He wants to perform miracles in our lives. See, the thing is, though, are we being intentional about putting ourselves in that position where we're saying, here I am, God. Please, I'm, I'm begging you to work that miracle in my life. Bring fruit into my life. You're the only one who can speak life into me. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying that we must devote ourselves to God. If you are not, <laughs> if you are not regularly, habitually practicing dying to yourself and surrendering yourself, offering yourself as a living sacrifice to God on a daily basis, how can you expect that you will be ready when He comes? Is that where one of the moments that's going to arrive and you're going to try real hard? Or is that a moment that you will have anticipated and you're ready because you've been letting the Lord prepare you all along? Jesus is our example in all things, is he not? Okay, so check it out. Jesus had a devotional life, just a, a few components that I can think of. Hi. 
Just a few components that I can think of right off the bat would include prayer. Now Jesus regularly, can you go sit with grandma? Yeah. Thank you buddy. Jesus regularly uh, would steal away and have prayer, wouldn't he? As this is showed in the scripture many times. And he would come apart for a while. And he needed that time. He needed that time to connect with the Heavenly Father so that he could be refreshed and encouraged so that he could get peace in the midst of his storm so that he could be strengthened for the task that was in front of him. And he is our example in doing the same thing. How about worship? Well, according to Scripture, it was Jesus' custom on the Sabbath that he would do what? He would come to the synagogue and he would worship. That was his custom. He was intentional about that. And furthermore, in overcoming, when Jesus was faced with temptation, it wasn't like he was just walking along, the temptation comes up and he goes, oh no, what am I going to do? When you think about it, when Jesus was tempted, when, when he went out into the desert for 40 days and at the end of that time, remember Satan showed up and he began to tempt him? And Jesus was literally starving physically and a lot was going on. Satan's showing up like an angel of light, right? Trying to tempt Jesus to make him think he's the cast out one. And here I am in all my angelic glory. Oh, well, if you're the son of God, then why don't you turn those stones into bread and have something to eat? And Jesus... How did he handle that temptation? What did he say? What? By the, By the word of God. It is written. That was his response, right? It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Right? And he handled each one of the successive temptations in exactly the same way. He broke out scripture. What does this indicate? Jesus was regularly into the scriptures, absorbing them, learning them, memorizing them, so that when he needed to use them in actual life, they were there and ready to use. Brothers and sisters, we must be intentional as disciples of God. If we are going to find ourselves in His kingdom, it will be because we planned on being in His kingdom. We chose that we wanted to. We made a plan to be. We executed that plan. We kept evaluating our life. We invited God to evaluate us even and say, search me and try me and show me if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And then we also then make adjustments as necessary, right? Does that make sense? A few of you agree? Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. This is the way of the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something. I want to plead with you. I want to urge you in this day and age, please do not be complacent about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Please do not take it lightly. If you sow to the Spirit, then you will reap of the Spirit. If you sow to the flesh, brothers and sisters, what you will reap is death. Amen? We must be intentional. Now, having said all of that, I have to temper it with this and I'll close. I am not by any stretch of the imagination saying that somehow we can work our way into heaven. Please do not mistake that for what I'm saying. I can no more work my way into heaven by doing the right things than I could make that tomato to appear on that plant by, you know, preparing the garden. I couldn't make that thing grow. God made that thing grow. Amen? Amen? And that's how it is in the spiritual life. The thing is, though, we want to make sure that we're affording God every opportunity to work that transformation that He wants to work in us 
Let's think about it, man. If he gets a chance to work the miracle in your life, not only will you have life and life more abundantly, but your family will start to be blessed because of what's going on in you. When your family is living inside of God's will and God is working a miracle inside of your family, then you become a tremendous blessing in this church family. And in this church family, they start to catch fire with what's going on in you. And I'm going to tell you something. When this church family has a miracle working in it because we have been intentional and we saw the power of God manifested in our church family this community is going to know that something is going on here something powerful something that's not of man but it's of God and something that they want to be a part of and it's supposed to work like that we need to be intentional Amen. At this time, I'm going to ask for our chorister to come and lead us in our closing song, and then we'll have prayer together. Our closing song today is actually, I have decided to follow Jesus. I hope you know that song. If you don't, you'll catch on quickly. I think we're going to have the lyrics up here. Is that correct? All right, very good, Brother Greg. Please stand. Is exactly what I am trying to ask. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back. Be very intentional. If that is your choice, with every eye open and every head raised, right here in front of God and everybody, could you raise your hand and raise it high? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us pray together. Oh, Father, you know us. You know us well. Sometimes, Lord, our resolve has been as though it were ropes of sand. But I pray, Lord, that today, on this day, as you have witnessed here in this assembly, so many people making a commitment, a choice to follow you. I pray, Lord, that you would come and empower those choices. That you would fortify the faith in each individual. That you would strengthen all of us, Lord. That we might truly, decidedly, devotedly be your disciples with very much intentionality as we live out each day. I'm asking for your blessing, Lord. We need you. 
we want to honor you. And I know that you have great things in store for us, Lord. You have a hope and a future for us. You don't want to just give us abundant life today. You don't just want to give us peace that passes understanding today. But you have a wonderful plan for us in your kingdom. Lord, as we spend time in your presence with your people and your creation without any blight of sin, no harm or hurt in all your kingdom, Lord, I, I'm so looking forward to that day when I finally see you. And I pray, Father, that you will see us safely home now. Help us in our resolve. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.